so now we're, after you uh, did this incredible stand-in for Gary, which is uh, something I think you, it says something about you. You think? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because as you yourself said, Gary was a hell of a guitar player. He was phenomenal. In fact, I, I, the first time I, I saw Thin Lizzy, I went to see Thin Lizzy for the first time because of a band that Gary Moore was in when he was 16. Oh, you're kidding. A band called Skid Row from Ireland. I know Skid Row. Skid Row from Ireland. I know so, Skid Row. Yes, so not the American Skid Row. This was, yeah, a, this was the original three-piece band. Yes. And I saw them first, and it was because of them saying, well, there's this other band that yeah. uh, I taught, you know, the bass player taught Philip how to play bass. And so that's why I went to see them. Oh, so, so to, so yeah, I think I there's, I think stupid probably say yeah, above probably my head, you know, to step into Gary Moore's shoes, stupid, naive, no. all of those things. But it was fabulous, knowing that all the time, of course, I was coming back from that mm -hmm. to go straight back to Ultravox. And the moment I got back, we wrote the VN album. Now, then you, does Snowy White fit in here somewhere? I didn't just do the one tour with Thin Lizzy. Um, I went on to do a Japanese tour with them maybe three, four months later. Uh, but again, very much as a hired gun. Philip at this point mm -hmm. wanted to introduce synthesizers, keyboards into what Lizzie were doing, which was kind of redundant really. Lizzie were a guitar band. So I was relegated to uh, playing keyboards up the back of the stage. And then I'd come down for the final five or six numbers with the guitar while they tried out new guitar players. Oh, nice. So they were looking for a replacement guitarist. And that's where Snowy White came in. I'm going to move on because, well, I, I really have a great appreciation for Snowy White's music. There's so much more you and I need to talk about. Okay. Let's start moving toward Ultravox, which I think is probably what people put behind your name almost every time they write Midjure. They have brackets that'll sure. say Ultravox. Does that make you happy? It makes me happy that uh, I've done something that seen, that's deemed worthy to, to go back and look at. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I was saying earlier off camera that no career is built on highs alone. You know, you have to have peaks and troughs, you have to have the highs and lows uh, to make the high bits high, you know, the next one that's coming along. Um, you so have to have a low to I, know what the high is. Absolutely, yes. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that, it, it, Ultravox was, a, was a, a major high for me. It was a great period. Um, uh, you know, I was given all the tools necessary for my toolkit, mm -hmm. you know, so I was allowed into the studio to do stuff. I was allowed to play with the synthesis. So I was allowed to do stage sets and work on graphics and all of that. So, so the entire band had these, this bag full of toys. And, and for a while it was just fabulous to do it. You're touring the world, uh, you know, coming over here a lot actually. Now, do you know a, a writer by the name of Neville Shute? Yes. Uh, do you know his uh, On the Beach? Uh, yes. Australia setting, yep. end of the world. Yep. Dancing with Tears, my eyes. Dancing with Tears, yes. Is that it? It is. I saw the movie uh, when I was a kid. It's a movie uh, about a uh, nuclear holocaust. There's been a war. And the last You're talking about On the Beach? Uh, on the Beach, yeah. Oh, it's fantastic, yes. Fantastic. I, I saw it as a kid. Yeah, so did I. Yeah. And I read it as a teenager. So, so did I. Yeah. So I saw the movie first, and, uh, and it's about uh, the, the last people left alive mm -hmm. in, the, in the planet, uh, living in Australia. Fred Astaire was in that. Fred Astaire was in it, yeah. I think it was his last thing. That's right. And, uh, well, it, and, and the, the fact that these people knew what was coming, this mm -hmm. cloud was coming towards mm -hmm. them, this mm -hmm. ominous thing and how they chose to spend the final days. Yes. I just thought it was fascinating, yes. I it was wonderful. Yes. And of course, uh, David Bowie's Five Years. Yes. That song from the Ziggy Stardust album was another one that just gave that Same. impending doom, we've got five years left to live, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So my take on that was Dancing with Tears My Eyes. You know, if you have four minutes left, the four minute warning, and you can't run away and you can't hide and you can't- What are you gonna do with them? What do you do? What, yeah. yeah. You're with the people you love and you put on your favorite piece of music and you dance with tears in your eyes. And uh, unfortunately, uh, in the movie or in the book, uh, Devil and Devil Shoot, they all had to take, they all had a pill That's available right. yeah. uh, so that they could go out the way they wanted to, even if it was before the final days. Well, Fred, the Fred Astaire character was a yes. racing driver, That's wasn't he? Right. 
and he decided to he... to get in his racing car and pretend he was in a race in his garage, so he asphyxiated yeah. himself. Uh, well, I, it's for me. I've got it's an anthem for me. Dancing with Tears in My Eyes is an anthem. There's a nine or a ten, ten minute version. I just can't stay away from it. Even now, all these years later, and. Many nights, I've, I, I play it in my show, and there are nights when I've sat in the studio all by myself with my little microphone and my players, and I've put on dancing, the long version, and halfway through, I got tears running down my face because wow. I, I attached myself to it so much. And I am so glad you said yes when I asked about Neville Shoot because oh. that's what I've always envisioned. Absolutely. It's, uh, there's no doubt about it. It's uh, direct lift from that whole scenario, that final what do you do in those final moments. What's your favourite ultra, ultra box song? Oh, uh, that's, that's difficult. I, we, when we, we got back together again six years ago to just do the touring, as I said, um, and during the tour we couldn't decide what to play, so we ended up, we, we, we took over the entire evening. Yeah. Uh, we did it in two parts. But in total, we were on stage for two and a half hours or something. So we played a lot of songs, a lot of songs. Yeah. And every night um, when we played Lament, something special happened. I don't know what it was. I mean, you know, we hadn't played the song for a long time. I hadn't even listened to it for a long time. But we rediscovered it. We found something quite haunting and poignant about this piece of music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it happens with a few, but that one was peculiar in the fact that the audience reacted exactly the same to the same song in different cities. Really? Yeah. Isn't it it just got this, this kind of rapturous applause. And it wasn't that big a single when it came out. It was a single and it was a, an album track and whatever. But it seems to have grown. It's, it grew into itself, kind of. It became a better song mm -hmm. for some reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another favourite for me is Vienna. Mm. Vienna is just an incredible composition. It is just brilliant. Uh, it, it just takes you away. It takes you places you didn't know you could get to. Well, it was, it was a classic example of four individuals coming together as a band mm -hmm. and all contributing there, putting their stamp on it. And you think of Vienna, uh, if you know the song, it's haunting, it's atmospheric, it's got electronic drums, it's got piano, it's got a viola solo in it, you know, it's got synthesized bass, da -ga 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 -ga. You take any one of those elements out of that song mm -hmm. and it falls apart. Yes, yes, I can and see each that. Each element is equally important. Mm -hmm. The heartbeat, boom, mm -hmm. boom, 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 you know, that heartbeat drum thing. That's as important as the piano. Da -da 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 -da. It's just a classic situation where, because of, and I put it down, a, a lot of it down to naivety, Mm -hmm. Because when you're young, you are naive. You you think you can do anything. You get a little naive when you're old too, by the way. But it's it's all you know. It's it's a good naivety. And you, when we came together, we had no boundaries. We weren't trying to write a hit single. We weren't trying to write a no. three minute pop no. song. No. We were writing a piece of music. Mm -hmm. And the the only reason it didn't come out as a single uh, until it did, because uh, it it was like the third single from the album, the yes. VN album, right. was that the record company wanted to edit it. And we said, no. where? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's not those. a piece of meat. You can't turn it into sausages. It's, <laughs> you know, you, yeah, what would you want to cut out? The <laughs> intro or, or, or the chorus or, or the viola solo? Yeah. It's all. Uh, so we ended up saying, I know, we'll do the same kind of edit. We'll get the guy who edited Hey Jude. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> what is that? What do, what do you mean? It's, it's only over four minutes long, but at the time, Radio would only play three-minute records. Yes, it's yes. crazy. I know. Well, it, th that was. Uh, there's still that problem at, at programming radio level. I think it's still that problem exists, and uh, I, quite frankly, I'd be surprised if anyone in radio played a, uh, in commercial radio played Vienna. Yeah. Yeah. I play it all the time on my shows. I love it. Oh, fantastic. Was it inspired by the city in any way? It was uh, a pure imagination on my part. Um, when I walked into the rehearsal room where we wrote the thing, yes. we actually wrote it in front of an a &R guy who'd flown over from America to see us specially. And he sat there for three days while we put it together and then didn't sign us. 
<laughs> and I have to tell you, the finished article that he heard was exactly what was going to go on the record. The, the yeah. exact arrangement. We'd done it all. We'd well, he done had it. three good days. I, I, it was fine. He enjoyed himself. Um, and it wonderful. was, we'd never been to Vienna, but, you know, we'd read about it. We knew about the secessionists yes. and all of that stuff. And you had it, not been when you wrote no, this one. No, not at all. It was pure fantasy. It was the idea that this, this uh, decaying elegance of this one's cultural, mm -hmm. you know, major cultural city, yeah. just like Paris was or whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's a you know, we, we went, of course, when we made the video. Yes. We, we went for the day. Have you played in Vienna? Uh, I have now. Uh, for some reason, every time Ultravox tried to play in Vienna in the, in the day, back in the 80s, yeah. uh, something would happen and we never Wasn't got there. Wasn't that curious? Yeah. We never, we never got there, which is really bizarre. What about your solo albums? What are you most proud of? Do we go back as far as the gift? Yes, you can go back as far as the gift. I did the gift within the uh, security blanket of being an Ultravox. Okay. You know, so, you know, so it wasn't really a It was a solo effort yeah. in the fact that I, you know, I, I did it outside the band. But if it wasn't six, I didn't really, I didn't even make it as an album. I kind of, I wanted to do something that was the antithesis of what Ultravox were doing at the time. And Ultravox were getting very technical and complicated. And I wanted to do something that was really simple and easy. And I love instrumental music. So half the album's instrumental. I didn't intend to have a hit record from it, but it happened. So when it happened, I went out and I toured it for a bit. And then I came back to, to Ultravox. What got in the middle, you know, it was meant to be a six month break we were having from each other. And I was going to make this album and release it, and tour it, and that's it. But something happened in the middle where I didn't, eventually get back to the band for two years and okay. that was the start of the, the decline of the band. You've done a lot of work with other artists. I'll go back to If I Was with Mick Carn. Uh, uh, Mark King, on, uh, uh, it was Mark King from Level 42. Yeah, yeah sorry I got that backwards. Didn't yeah, it? yeah uh, Mark King on, uh, on If I Was playing bass. Yes. Um, I did uh, After Fashion with Mick Carn from Japan. Yeah, that's what, oh, it's After Fashion I'm thinking of, brilliant sorry, brilliant I got bass confused. Player. Yeah, uh, yeah, I collaborated with quite a few people. Uh, I actually played this just this past weekend, and uh, I have a feeling that you really, really appreciated this woman's talent. Of course, you know I'm just speaking of Kate Bush. You did that wonderful work with her together. Sister and brother. Mm. I, I remember seeing, I was I, I, in 1977 or 78 when I joined the Rich Kids and I moved to London. And we were signed by EMI. And I was in the EMI offices in Manchester Square. Uh, in London, and I'm talking to one of the secretaries. I was there to do an interview or something. And behind the secretary were, were these pictures. And there's a picture of this beautiful young, mm -hmm. you know, girl up there. Yes, yes. Kate Bush. And I said, was, was this, this before she had ever... Oh, before. I, nobody, wow. nobody knew anything about her. And I said, uh, who's that, Kate Bush? And the girl turned to a friend and said, Who's the hippie? <laughs> Pointing at Kate's photograph. I thought, what? Little did she know that this hippie was about to just yeah. change everything you know, with Wuthering Heights. But yeah, I'd, I'd met Kate many times. I'm a huge admirer. Uh, she was, she's just outstanding. Uh, she's from a different planet. Yeah, the work you did with her is, is very special. I was very honoured to have someone like Kate. When did you, when did you do... Uh, Hang on. When did you do Sister and Brother? Uh, I was working on, I think it's the Answers to Nothing album, um, uh, my second uh, solo record. My first proper solo record, I'll call it, because I didn't have the luxury of having Ultravox as a safety net. And, uh, and Kate and I had been, we had performed at the Prince's Trust uh, concert yes. in, uh, in London for yeah. Prince Charles, it's his big charity. And, um, and we were at a, a, a party organised by Prince Charles and I was chatting to Kate. Was it stuffy? It was, no, it wasn't actually. It wasn't. It was all the artists. So it was far from, you know, okay. Jules Holland was 
Charles said, Jules, you please be out. So he, he chose to sit and play Boogie Woogie Piano, and it was the most, and I'm in, you know, Kensington Palace. It was very bizarre. And I thought, I thought after a few drinks, I'm chatting to Kate, and I said, well, you know, I've got this song, and you know, I'd love to do it as a duet, and she, she was great. She said, I'm in the middle of my own album, send me over the master tape, and I'll, I'll do something. So I, I sent her the I sent her the cassette and then I sent her the master tape. The one problem is I never got to see her work on it. But she called me up a few days later and said, "Do you want to come to the studio and hear what I've done?" Oh, yes. And I turned up at the studio expecting just to hear she'd done a little bit of you know lead vocal, and she put this thing on, and she'd obviously spent hours and hours working out these multi harmonies, mm -hmm. these big mm -hmm. choral vocals and mm -hmm. and I stood and it was my turn to have tears in my eyes. I stood there with just like an idiot, you know, just listening to this wonderful thing. So I was very proud of that track. That's so magic though, isn't it? When music does that. Yeah, yeah. When music stirs the soul, the mind and indeed the body. I think you know, what we were talking about earlier about, you know, artists being uh, fragile. Mm -hmm. You know, we think we're cocky and we're not. I think it was the ultimate pat in the back that someone like Kate, someone you respect and admire, mm -hmm. actually respects and admire, admires what you do as well. Because Kate wouldn't do anything unless she, she liked it. Yeah, yeah. You know, she's a she's a tough cookie. Yeah. And uh, to have the uh, to have it kind of sanctioned uh, by someone of that stature was just phenomenal. In the early days of CFNY, I don't know what year it was. Uh, when the first album came out, Kate's first album, mm -hmm. what was that, 79, 80 maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably, yeah. Uh, she came out to the radio station on a Saturday morning to do an interview. And uh, I, I drove in because I wanted to say hi to her, and I, I, was, I was very impressed with her work. And uh, we, we got on quite well, and uh, as she was leaving, she was, I said, that's a beautiful jacket you're wearing, I love your jacket. And she took it off and said, it's yours. I wow. still have it. Well, that's fantastic. It says Kate Bush on the back, and it says Kate Bush here on, on the boob. Fantastic. Yeah. I was going to bring it today and give it to you, but she I forgot. She never travelled again after that, did she? No, she didn't. I she, don't never, think she, she never crossed the Atlantic. It was, I think it, on the jacket it was a Euro tour, Euro tour, but I can't remember the year. It might have been 79. So I, saw, uh, I saw her perform in London. Uh, 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 yeah, she played the London Palladium. Not that long ago? Uh, no, I, I, I saw, the, I saw the, the recent one, yes. but I saw her do the first ever... Uh, shows in London. She did maybe, I don't know, a week's worth of shows or something in the one theatre. And I, I, I was, was told that, that it was incredible. Oh, it's phenomenal. I, I've never actually I've met her, as you know, I tell you that little story. Uh, and I haven't seen her perform since back then. But I've always been an admirer of her voice and her talent. Yeah. Now you have one other thing that people do or don't know. I. I don't know, but it's a pretty major thing. You sat down one day with uh, Bob Geldof, mm. and what happened? We wrote a song. We've never written one sentence, but we wrote one song. <laughs> and it was called? <laughs> uh, Did They Know It's Christmas? And you were totally immersed in that, and you still are. Yes, I'm still a, I'm still a Band-Aid trustee, so as is Bob, and as are the rest of the trustees who are still alive that we put together to oversee the, the funds that this was going to raise. So yeah, it was back in 1984 and uh, Bob was at home and saw this piece of footage on the news uh, of this famine in Ethiopia and he phoned his wife who was co-hosting a show, a TV show that mm -hmm. I was on and I'd known Bob for ages, he said let me speak to him. And we talked, we talked about what he had just seen, I hadn't seen it at this point, but Bob because the Boomtown Rats had been and gone, yes. didn't feel he was in a position to do anything about this on his own. He wanted to do something. And he said, well, you help. Let's meet up and talk. And we came to the conclusion that if we wrote a Christmas song, that if we got enough talent on there, we might, we might get a Christmas number one. And if you get a Christmas number one, you can generate two or three times the amount of sales. At this point, had you thought of it with other musicians involved or just the two of you? No, it wasn't just, oh, God, no, I don't think that would have been, you know, it would have sold two copies at that point, wouldn't it? He would have bought one. No, I would have bought two and given him one. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I think the plan was always, let's see who's out there. Let's get some of our mates involved in this. And uh, strangely enough, I mean, this is absolutely true. Uh, after the meeting, I, I went back to my little house and started working on a, a keyboard, a little toy keyboard on my kitchen table. Da, 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 and Bob, on his way home, bumped into, <clears throat> as you do, Simon Le Bon, uh, because Bob lived just off King's Road and, mm -hmm. and a very cool, trendy area of London. Uh, or was it Simon? Uh, was it? It was. I tell you, what it was. It was Gary Kemp. He bumped okay. into Fust from Spandau Ballet, oh, and he okay. said, "We're doing this thing. Midge and I are doing this thing. You know, you need to Spandau need to do it." And of course, Gary said, "Absolutely." Mm -hmm. And then he turned the corner and bumped into Simon Le Bon, yeah, okay, yeah. who were big, you know, of rivals course. at the time. Yes, yes. And he said, "Well, you've got to get Janan." And of course, the first thing that people ask when, when you know, with the best will in the world, when you phone up an agent or a manager or whatever, and you say, "We're going to do this charity thing," the first thing they ask is, "Who else is doing it?" Yeah. Because then they can gauge whether it's right yes, for their artist. Yes. Um, but when you've got Simon Le Bon, you've got you've got Geran and you've got Spandau on yes. board already. Yes. That's like, you, you don't have to ask. And then you ended up with oh, we had a, a amazing twenty six, twenty seven key key artists. And you really did it in the twenty four hours, didn't you? I spent four days in my studio because uh, you know I sent Bob my twiddlings on a cassette, and he thought it was dreadful. And then he came over to my house with a guitar that had hardly any strings on it and started singing, Who's Christmas Day again? <laughs> doing this and, uh, and I said, well, look, I recorded what he was doing because every time he sang it was different. So I, I went into my studio, which yes. I'd just built. Yes, this was in your home? In, in, at home, yeah. yeah. And I started piecing together building blocks, trying to put together some kind of form. And uh, he ran up a, a massive telephone bill, uh, phoning artists saying, we're doing this thing, you have to come and do it. But because in those days there was no internet. Oh no, no mobile there was phone. No. No, mobile phones, yes you could, but I didn't know anyone else who had one. So. Well no, and they were the size of a Volkswagen. <laughs> That's just huge things. And it was so embarrassing having one. I used to, I used to go into a telephone box to use my phone, because it was so embarrassing having it out in the street. You know? It's true. They were it's true. Things. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we had we had 24 hours in the studio to do uh, all the vocals, uh, Phil Collins drums, and mix the record. Um, and bear, and you've got to remember, uh, which most people can't even comprehend, that all the artists who turned up on the day had never heard the song. Really? Yeah, it's not like you today where you can send them where you can send them an anything? MP3. Yeah. No, that was it. We had just I just finished the track a couple of days before or whatever. Oh my goodness. So they turned up blind, as it were, and committed, ready to do whatever was necessary. And did it turn into a party or was it a serious production? I was chained, manacled to the mixing desk. I didn't really get out right. at all. Right. Um, I, I, we did have to kick them all out the studio at uh, like eight o'clock at night. Okay. And of course, at that point, it was kind of turning into a party. Not a party as in drinks and no, stuff around. It was, they were enjoying themselves. Celebrating the moment. Celebrating the moment. And they'd, they'd done it, the pressure was off. They'd all done the parts and they'd all sung the big chorus thing. But, uh, you know, you have to feel sorry for them. as these, you know, uber rich rock stars. In London, one of the most vibrant cities in the world, on a Sunday night, with the world at their feet, mm -hmm. and they'd know where to go. <laughs> so I've kicked them all. We kicked them all out of the studio. Now remind me of the date that that happened. I can't. You know what? I, I, I was it I, December the eleventh? Something like that. It, yes. it the, the twenty-four hour period to make the record. We had twenty-four hours because it had to be in the pressing plants next morning at like nine o'clock in the morning. How long before it was heard on the radio in London? The morning. We finished the record, mm -hmm. done, mixed, mm -hmm. ready, master tape getting sent to the pressing plant, and Bob took a cassette and went to Radio 1. How many national. hours have you been going now? This is, this is a 24 hour period. Right. But I've been awake 24 hours doing okay. this, uh, and uh, three or four days beforehand or whatever. Um, so he takes a cassette to Radio 1, and I'm driving home, you know, exhausted. Yeah. And, uh, I hear on, on the, Bob comes on the radio and uh, the DJ puts the cassette on. The BBC don't play cassettes. No, no. So it's unsolicited. At this point, it's headline news. And it's, you're it's in your front car. front page news. I'm in my car. And you're driving And home. I hear what I've just finished being played on the radio. And the moment it finished, they rewound the tape and they played it for a second time. 
Now, tell me Unheard how that of. felt. How that it, unbelievable. I, at that point, even though I knew, uh, you know, the papers come out that morning, all had you know, the centre fold picture of all the artists, and the, it was front page news and all of that stuff. The moment I heard them play that track twice, I knew there was something, something bizarre and wonderful happening. <laughs> you know, I know you have an OBE. Yes. I'd like to call you sir. <laughs> I love it. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. That great. was great fun. Great. Thank you.